Here we have a ceiling fan, and from what I'm told by the fellow YouTuber over at House of Ceiling Fans, that's the name of his channel, I'm told by him that this is a very expensive model and that I should not have ruined it by putting these convex mirrors on the blades. And the purpose of this video and this channel is to try and help, if I can, elucidate how, from my view, I have not ruined the fan, I've improved it. By improving my life, by making this fan more functional, more beneficial than by way of its original design alone. I've enhanced it. I've enhanced it in a way that people who manufacture ceiling fans do not understand nor appreciate at this time. And this is subtle knowledge, but it's progressive knowledge. It's advanced knowledge. It's steeped in sources that are of a certain tradition, namely the tradition of healers, as opposed to doctors. This is not science, what I'm going to describe to you. Although, it's not the science we've come to know. Let's put it that way. It's a more older style of science based on observation, experimentation, and a kind of a naturalist view of the world in that we don't try to dictate to each other, or to the world for that matter, what science is. We're a little more humble in the more traditional sense in that we observe nature and we describe it the way it is, but we don't make it that way. In terms of rules or, or theories about how science works, we don't make it happen that way. I mean, we don't, we don't say there's like a law you know, the naturalist, I don't think their approach would be to say, well, this is the law of science. No, uh-uh, who's going to enforce the law, huh? God, are you God? No, none of us are God that we can enforce the laws of nature, but we can describe in a, our observation of how nature works. And we don't have to understand why. Just say, that's, what ha that's the way it is. Just like... Um, it might be sufficient to know from a from a parental standpoint let's let's put it that way from a from a responsible individual standpoint if i cut myself do i not bleed that's shakespeare so i quote shakespeare as my reference for how i go about what i'm going to describe to you and shakespeare was not trying to be a scientist but he was an observer a keen observer of of nature of human nature and so what I'm going to, going to describe to you is my observation of the, my natural environment and how I can make an improvement in my, in my immediate environment. This is my bedroom. This is where I work. I work at the computer. I um, do my experiments on my experiment table, which doubles as my eating table. I have all my equipment on racks that I stockpile. And here, and I sleep on my bed, right underneath my ceiling fan. So I'm going to describe to you what I've learned that flies in the face of conventional wisdom. And you'll say, well, I don't know, that doesn't sound right. Well, the only way you'll know is to try and see if it helps you. And this is not something that will help you overnight. This is intended to reprogram your not just your physiology but your mind in a way that doesn't force you to do anything but very subtly steer you in better directions and it does so by changing your local environment this room this environment this this room is my environment I'm not too concerned with what goes on outside but what I'm going going to describe to you is predicated on on observations made by individuals, other individuals that I'm going to describe to you, 
in which they were trying to change their outside environment. It was called etheric weather engineering. And they tried to make it rain. They tried to clear the smog. And one individual in particular, two individuals actually, have documented, one in particular actually, has documented his efforts spanning two decades. And it was in an easy environment, the Pacific Ocean. It's very easy to make it rain in that environment. But he went ahead and validated his skillfulness by making it rain in L.A. of all places, Los Angeles, during the summer. And in a, a subsequent year, he made the smog diminish and sent all the research scientists who, were, who came to L.A. That, that summer with research grants under their arm to study L.A.'s smog had to pack it home because there was no smog to study. They had to come back the following year when this fellow, Trevor Constable, refused to make the smog go away because nobody was interested. Government wasn't interested in his methods. But it was effective. It worked. By engineering, etherically engineering the weather. And the principle is very simple, and I'm going to describe it to you. You take a conic shape. He, he used several techniques, but I'm going to describe to you what technique this is. In its utter simplicity, you take a conic shape, a cone, you know, all those jokes we used to hear about on Saturday Night Live back in the 80s about the Coneheads, Dan Aykroyd and the Coneheads, and uh, Jane Seymour, and uh, Gilda Radner. They're all making jokes about Coneheads, the aliens, you know, who have cone-shaped heads. And then we have another jibe that we make in our culture. The, the dorks with the beanie caps with propellers on top. Oh, they're such dorks. Look at them. they got the beanie caps with the propellers on top. I think it came out of the 50s, and then by the time uh, the 70s rolled in, we were already making fun of them. The only fault with that beanie cap is they didn't go all the way with it. They didn't put a motor on the propeller to keep it spinning all the time, such as what we do with ceiling fans, and they didn't take it the ne next step further and attach to those propellers convex mirrors. So let's get a close-up view of what I've done here. I've gone to the 99 cent store and to the hardware store to get various uh, uh, <laughs> convex mirrors with double tape backing so you can take off the peel and you can stick it. But of course I wiped these blades, these balsa wood blades, with with a wet paper towel to uh, clean them. I didn't want to use soap because I didn't want to leave a residue, a soap residue that might uh, cause, uh, help cause these mirrors to fall off at some point and shatter glass all over the place because I, I run this at medium speed, the medium setting. Um, I'm a little too tremulous to try it on the high setting and frankly it would be kind of drafty in here if I ran it all the time on high setting. I run it all the time, night and day, summer, winter, fall, spring, regardless of how it feels in the winter. It can feel pretty drafty running this in the winter. But I got used to it because I know its value. It has to run all the time. I'm just stopping it now to show you what it looks like and the relevant importance of how I designed this. Now, I tried putting paper cones on this, and there was too much air drag, wind, wind resistance, against the motor spinning with just paper cones on here such that the um, coils in the electric motor overheated and started to cook and it stunk of burnt rubber. So I knew I had to try a different technique and it turns out this is actually more powerful than paper cones and I'm going to describe to you why. A convex mirror is a cone in the sense that it's in that direction. It's moving in that direction. It's becoming a cone in the sense that the convexity of the glass coming out in the center of the mirror, as opposed to the edges that are more shallow, more narrow, more thin, it's in the direction of a parabolic arch. And a parabolic arch is very similar to a cone. It's just got a rounded tip, that's all. 
So a convex mirror is a shallow parabolic arch, and a parabolic arch is, uh, is a cone with the tip rounded off a little bit. So convex mirrors are perfect. They're cheap. Hey, you can get two for a dollar at a 99 cent store. You can spend a little more money, three or four dollars, at a hardware store and get a slightly larger one that I have over here. This one is, I think, a four inch convex mirror. So you can see the convexivity of it by the way the light from my cell phone flash shines on the mirror, depending on where I position my flash. Um, you can see how it rounded it is. It's basically a convex surface. See, it's very shallow, it's not much, but it's there. And then I have them on the top side too. I have it on both sides. I have it on the top side and the bottom side directly underneath. So I have it on both sides. And what that does is it creates, when light hits it, the reflected light fans out from the edges and in the center it comes straight down. And so it's angled, the reflected beams are angled in the shape of a cone. So we've got cones of reflected light coming down, inverted from the direction that the convex mirror is taking, and then we've got the convexity of the mirror that's also a cone, but this cone is pointing downwards, its so-called tip, while the reflected beams of light are pointing upwards into it. And so I've got a double hourglass going on here, top and bottom of the blade. And an hourglass is very important or very uh, powerful. I'm going to lay down here while I talk. It's very powerful. Oh, I'm gonna, why don't I turn it on? It's very powerful, according to Trevor Constable, and the package um, of information is available at trevorconstable.com. That's T-R-E-V-O-R-C-O-N-S-T-A-B-L-E.com. And for a very inexpensive price, you can buy that package of information and download it and watch his homemade, home-style videos of his 20 years of research on rain engineering. But this, t this approach is more mild. I'm not trying to make it rain. I'm just trying to improve the weather inside my working and living environment such that I have more vitality. And the reason being is when you take a cone, a cone basically a attracts the attention of the ether, of the prana, of the life force that's, that is all around us. And this is an aspect of free energy devices, but not in the sense of creating electricity, but trying to boost the life force in the immediate vicinity, directly underneath the center of the vortex of the spinning action, as well as above, but I can't make use of what's above because I'm not above it, the ceiling fan, but I'm below it and very near the center, a little off-center obviously, but near the center, at least while I lay here in bed. And when you take a cone, first of all, the cone shape attracts the ether's attention. But now you get the, the cone spinning, and now you get the ether spinning in this area. You create a vortex in the ether, a vortex in the prana, a vortex in the life force. And if you know anything about tornadoes, don't they suck? Don't they have this vacuum cleaner style sucking action in which they literally pull various artifacts such as uh, cows and trees and, and entire houses and buildings up out of their roots and toss them in, into the air as if they were toothpicks and playing car or playing cards as if they were like nothing. Well, that's what a churning action does. It sucks. And what does the, an etheric churning do? It sucks prana into the local environment, into, lo, into the local vicinity of where the, the center of the churn is occurring. And the direction of spin is important. You see here, this is counterclockwise. I live in North America, north of the equator, and I discovered by trial and error that 
this is the correct direction I should have it spin. If I spin the other way, it, it actually doesn't feel good, doesn't feel right. Um, so counterclockwise, as viewed from below, is the correct direction of spin. And so what this does is it pulls in life force into this immediate area so that it's more concentrated here, which means I get the benefit of that added life force. Now, why would that be something beneficial more than just for good health? Well, the old adage, health is wealth, is more than just a uh, cliché. I think, in my opinion, the correct name for money is prana. If, we had, if I had to think of a way, uh, what word in Sanskrit would, would correctly define what wealth and money is, what Sanskrit term would I use? It would be prana, the Sanskrit term for life force, what we call the ether in Western vernacular, in ter Western terminology, the ether. Good weather, fair weather, that's what wealth is, is life force. And if you have more of it, if you attract it towards yourself, you become more wealthy. How? Well, there are different ways of analyzing how. First of all, you don't slam the, your, your, so, the door of your mind, so to speak, in the face of opportunity. Because if, if wealth wants to come, it comes like a beggar coming to the door who wants to sell you uh, a, a used vacuum cleaner. And you oh, I don't need you. I, I've got a vacuum cleaner. But un inside that vacuum cleaner, for all you know, may be gold dust. And you don't know it because he looks slovenly, sloppy, he looks like an old man, and he comes with a used vacuum cleaner. Why would you want to buy a used vacuum cleaner? Because tucked inside is gold dust, and he doesn't tell you. You're supposed to be able to figure that out for yourself. How? Well, I'm describing to you how to take something as innocent as a ceiling fan, which already generates wealth just by spinning it. Already it has that effect, but it becomes augmented if you add convex mirrors to the underside, to the top side. I only do one per blade per side. So that's, it is a five-bladed ceiling fan, so I only use ten mirrors. I, I don't feel the need to use any more than that. And I put them near the center where, where they spin faster, actually. Well, no, they spin slower, actually. No, they, they, would, sp they would be traveling more distance in, in the same length of time and thus be spinning fast, uh, moving faster if I had them out near the edge. But I was afraid that that would destabilize their glue backing more readily and cause them to detach more readily, and I didn't want to take that risk. So out of fear and caution, I put them more towards the center. But maybe the, it would be more powerful if they were placed at the tips. I don't know. Um, but whatever you do, do it the same way with all of them so as not to imbalance the thing, because these things are very delicate in their operation. Um, and I did try different sizes. I'm not sure if that helps at all. I'm pretty certain that it helps probably to put them on both top side and bottom side, though. So this is about wealth. Now, how would it improve somebody's wealth? Well, the mind, there, there are two different ways of analyzing. There's creativity and there's intelligence. So creativity is an outgrowth of a what? A kind of a urgency or an energy that comes from within, the ability to move your butt and get up off your butt and do stuff. But then there's the other aspect, and that's intelligence. That's the ability to make good decisions and so when opportunity comes knocking, you don't um, walk away from it. And yet, on the other hand, what about the intelligence that, that I tend to um, make the mistake of overdoing things, taking on too much, more than I can handle, and, and then causing such uh, failure because I just wasn't prepared. I didn't prepare in advance to consider, can I handle the, the situation, the opportunity that I'm trying to take advantage of? And maybe I'm not prepared for it. Maybe I'm not ready. So there are all kinds of ways of analyzing wealth because one way, uh, one way to look at wealth is 
not to lose not to lose an opportunity but also not to lose the wealth you already have not to waste it see so there are all different ways of analyzing wealth but that's just in hindsight you know and and, and I don't turn this on and then remind myself oh I'm I'm spinning this thing so now I should remember to be wealthy no uh-uh. the whole point is you turn it on you forget about it you get so used to it spinning night and day that you forget about it and you go about your business. Sure, for the first few weeks you're going to be thinking about it because it's drafty. Oh, God, it's, I, I started doing this in the middle of the winter. And I had to put on extra clothes and I had to uh, put a, a room heater in my room here to heat up the place because I was very chilled. It was very uncomfortable. But I got used to it. And so now I don't mind it being on all the time. Night and day. Summer, fall, spring, winter, doesn't matter. The conditions, I run it all the time because I know that's the only way it'll work is to run it all the time. Never change the direction and never turn it off. Even when I go away on a trip, I leave it on. You know why? Because when I come back, because it, it serves like a beacon, like a, like a uh, what do you call it, a lighthouse beacon. beacon. You know, a lighthouse, they, they spin the beacon around, and for ships at sea, they use it to steer clear of the coast, the rocky coast. Well, this becomes my beacon, because then I know where home is. When I leave, I know home is where home is, and I'm darn sure going to want to come back home is just as soon as I get done with my trip, because I'm not going to want to stay away. In fact, the last time I took a trip, I got sick after the second day. I had a six-day trip, a business trip, and... I got sick, and I didn't, not right away, but after two days, and I didn't get well until the minute I got back, I immediately got better. It, it, it Within less than a day, just a few hours, I was better, but I was really sick. I was like coming down with like a flu condition. It was really disgusting, and I was doing everything possible I could think of to stay healthy, but you know, when you go traveling, who has ceiling fans uh, in, in a hotel room? Much less do they put convex mirrors on them, you know? I mean, there's no, obviously, there's, see, there's no way to test this theory of mind, this observation, I should say, this hypothesis, born of observation, unless I went and installed a portable, um, you know, do-it-yourself ceiling fan in any location that I sh end up with, like a hotel room, to see what happens, you know? So, <laughs> how many, I mean, this for me is like new. Uh, how many, my mother never installed a ceiling fan in our home because she thought we didn't need one. And my ex-honey didn't want uh, us to install a ceiling fan in the guest house where we were staying at the time, so I never had a chance to find out, you know? If I could modify a ceiling fan by marrying it to etheric weather engineering technology, but I managed to do so simply because I moved into this room as happenstance would have it, as coincidence would have it, and I had a ceiling fan, which I n rarely ever turned on and made use of. And I realized, well, let's see, I want to restart my etheric weather, weather engineering uh, modification experiments. How do I do it? I need, to, I need to do it differently than what I've done in the past. I need to try the cone experiments, the conic section experiments of Trevor Constable because they seem to be very effortless. You just set up a spinning device with cones attached and, and then just forget about it and see if it improves the weather. And I, th and I thought to myself, well, I don't have any spinning device. What? And wait a minute, I do. It's the ceiling fan right above me. Okay, I'll put it to good use. And so I tried paper cones and that didn't work. I tried cones made out of chicken wire and mesh wire. That was useless. And then I installed convex mirrors inside those mesh um, cones, and immediately it, it empowered it tremendously. And then I removed the mesh cones and just put the convex mirrors on the blades, and it was perfect. I had the most perfect, aerodynamically perfect way to modify a, a ceiling fan so that it can actually churn the ether in your location and whether or not it brings fair weather and clears out the smog and chemtrails and helps bring rain and normalize the weather so that whatever weather should come will come and will not be kept from coming by way of you know stagnant or door deadly or that deadly orgone that Wilhelm Reich talks about whether or not that's the case I know one thing is the case 
it churns the ether inside my living space so that I have fair weather having a psychological and physiological impact that is so obvious to me now that I've been running it for several months, about half a year, that I know now that health is wealth and fair weather is health. All three are dynamically interrelated equivalences. Good weather, good health, and wealth. All three are equivalent terms. You do one to any one of those three and you're going to have an impact on the other two. And this is an easy, effortless, cheap way to create that result. Is install a ceiling fan in each of your rooms, major rooms, if you don't already have them, installed. Run them night and day, at the very least on the lowest setting, on the slowest speed. Get used to that first. That's what I did. I, I realized right away I was no way was I was gonna run this at the highest setting. I'm telling you, because it disturbs the psychology. We're used to thinking that the home is a static environment where we want every our comfort zone inside our home to be very static and still like a pond in which the water doesn't move. Well, you know what happens in a pond of water when the water doesn't move? You get algae, you get bacteria, you get mosquitoes and malaria. Disease. That doesn't work. Wilhelm Reich was correct in calling stagnant orgone his term for the life force, deadly, door, D-O-R, deadly or, deadly orgone, deadly life force is when it stagnates. The only time it's healthy is when it's constantly moving. And you know what? It works the same way with money. It's called acceleration. Any economist who studies the mechanics of wealth and money collectively in society, not the, the wealth of individuals, that's all we're taught in school and on TV and the movies is the wealth of individuals. But what do they do? They get busy like a bank robber. He gets busy. He gets off his ass and he risks his life robbing a bank, you know? But that's the acceleration value of money. Or you go out and you get a job. Well, here we're churning the ether and that creates wealth because it keeps things in motion. It, it prevents stagnation. And that's a psychological state you don't want to fall into if you want to stay healthy, wealthy, wise, <laughs> and what did I leave out? Healthy, wealthy, what was the third one? Fair weather. And if you want fair weather. You know, not extremes, you know. You don't want them to last long. If they do come, they break up. They don't last for too long. And, and so you get, you know, mo moderation. You get a moderation to your weather condition in your local environment, which is inside the room where this thing is running. What else can I say about this? Um, I've, I've pretty much gone all over all the superlatives. So Wilhelm Reich, and I'm, I'm pronouncing it properly, but the spelling it from the German is R- E I C H Wilhelm Reich he died in prison because he was so effective at what he was doing making rain in fact I'm so impressed with Donald Sutherland made participated with a musical artist from Great Britain who made a music video in the around I think it was 1980 I want to say 1980 I'm not sure the year um and it's on YouTube. It's only four minutes long or so. And it's on as a tribute to Wilhelm Reich and his son and the book that his son wrote, the biographical book that his son wrote, Peter Reich, on the life of his father as a rainmaker and what impact that had on his own personal life as his son. But I, I'm really impressed that Donald Sutherland, the actor, got involved with that, the making of that music video, playing the part of Wilhelm Reich. And I can't remember the name of the gal who dressed up as a young boy uh, who sings in that music video, who um, is the composer and artist of that uh, music video. Um, but she played the part of 
Peter Rush, the son. Anyway, it dramatizes one of the forebears that we of the shoulders the pair of shoulders we stand on when we want to give credit where credit is due for the proper understanding of re etheric rain engineering weather modification the other person is trevor constable those two individuals are very prominent in our culture or should be uh... another individual who's not so prominent is peter lindeman and he has a website um, freeenergy.ws and there's a hyphen between free and the word energy and ws represents the state of washington in which he lives so freeenergy.ws is the other individual who also helped trevor constable develop his technology a little bit further but trevor constable spent twenty years of his life and constantly experimenting because he had a lot of free time and it was a perfect environment the pacific ocean where it's very easy to make it rain so opportunity made it easy for him to experiment but he got so good at it he could do it in in like I said before in the summertime in LA either make it rain or make the smog go away which is a a little easier because it's less effort in, involved in making the smog go away making it rain is is a, a bit more effort involved um, but either way those are huge majestic accomplishments uh, in LA in the summer of all things I'm going for something much smaller uh, something more modest I just want to improve my environment where I work and live and sleep so that I have a better quality of life that's all that's good enough I don't have to worry what happens outside it's none of my business they want to spray chemtrails fine they'll do it I may not like it but hey you know it's not my area of control. I can't control. I, I mean, I'm not going to even try. I know I could if I wanted to, but it takes effort. And I don't want to make an effort, see. They're, they're making an effort getting up in, in their planes and, and spraying the skies. No, I don't want to make an effort. This is so easy. Well, a 99 cent store? Two convex mirrors for, for 50 cents a piece? Come on. I don't even have to pay for the ceiling fan. It's, it was already installed, and according to my friend over on the YouTube channel, House of Ceiling Fans, this is a very expensive ceiling fan, which I've modified. So I have a beautiful ceiling fan, and I've got cheap convex mirrors I've attached, and I went to the added expense of going to the hardware store and getting some of theirs. So I spent a few bucks, all under, what, certainly less than $15 total but I run it constantly so there's a little electric electrical usage but I started at the lowest setting to get used to it and only recently about a month or two ago I, I stepped it up to the medium speed and I found it, it it was an improvement when it spins faster but I'm still hesitant to go too fast because I'm afraid of the glass flying off and shattering you know and making a mess maybe an injury injuring me I don't know so I'm being very cautious um, so I spun it on the low setting, and that got me adjusted to the impact that it had on churning the ether. And very gradually getting used to that um, modification of my environment. Because it's, it's quite a head trip to change your environment. The psychology of churning the ether will affect your psychology. It'll be disturbing. You won't like it. But it's worth it because it improves the quality of life. What do you think kids do? They run around all day. You know, before they get older and start to slow down, I, I had cats, the same thing. Before they, before they hit adolescence and start to slow down, they run around like crazy. And you think they're nuts. It's, they're not nuts, they're just full of vibrant energy. And what do you do when you're full of vibrant energy? You can't sit on your butt. You've got to run around and work it off. And that's the natural result of being full of abundant energy and good health. So it'll be disturbing at first. So go easy on yourself and, and turn it on and run it constantly night, night and day at the lowest, slowest setting. And get used to that. See if you can get used to that. It'll take a few months. It's not going to be overnight. So there is some work involved. The patience of perseverance on your part to put up with this. And when you put the convex mirrors on, it's just going to make it more powerful. You try it. You know, try it without the mirrors first and see if it has any effect on you. If it doesn't, try putting the convex mirrors on. 
and seeing if it doesn't make it more intensely disgusting, you know? Because <laughs> if you're not used to being healthy, you know, if you're used to being sickly and stubborn refusal to move your butt and lazy, you know, it, the, the people who are not lazy don't have to worry. They probably don't need this. If you're not lazy, you don't need this. If you're a go-getter, you, you probably already have no problem. But see, I, my life was shattered when my son was taken from me. And I was taken to the brink of suicide, and all I wanted to do was sit and become a vegetable. I, I literally was in a very bad way. And this has helped me tremendously get out of my lazy, depressed rut that I had fallen into and churn myself. And it was very disturbing and very uncomfortable. But I wouldn't want to live without this. It is so significant, yet... I don't think about it. My attention is never on this. The only reason why it's on it now is because I want to share with you my experience of half a year of running this thing. It's been a godsend. It's really, and it's so effortless, and I really have to give thanks to the individuals who made this knowledge possible. Wilhelm Reich, Trevor Constable, Peter Lindemann, and his assistant, Aaron Murakami, they have all helped me appreciate the value behind this so that I don't have to do something that would require me to be a saint to get the same results. There's a fellow by the name of Lakshmanju who is a saint of the, of the Kashmiri order of tantric, tantric yogis. And he's passed. He's no longer with us, but in body. But he came to L.A., at the request of some individuals who were here and did a fire cer ceremony, a yagya, to the sun, who's in charge of the moon, to tell the moon to make it rain and stop the drought. And he came and he did that and he made offerings to the fire yagya. You know, he threw walnuts in the fire as a sacrifice and various other offerings to the fire. But he's a saint. He can do stuff like that, you know. He knows what he's doing. He's a shaman of a very high order. Well, in a very small way, I'm being shamanistic in, in setting up the ceiling fan the way that I've done and running it night and day. I'm taking responsibility for myself because I don't have Lakshmanju here to help me. Or maybe I do in spirit, you know. Maybe he guided my little footsteps to, to craft this the way that I've done so. I, I, I have to give credit somewhere because I know I, I couldn't have done this on my own entirely. There's no way I could have. But I want to share it with you so that your life is more rich, more full, like mine has been, because of this. Now, I have to admit, it's a crutch. and it me, but, it, but it's a crutch in a nice way because I know where home is. Home is, is where we feel comfortable, right? Home is where we feel recharged when we come home. You know, when I had an apartment full of cats... That was my way to get recharged the minute I came home. Because they were all at the door waiting to greet me, all five of them. Oh, they were so eager to greet me. They just wanted to smother me with, with their love. They, they, was, they were so full of, of appreciation for when I came home to greet them. It was like a bunch of kids, you know. Oh, Daddy's home, you know. And that was my source of revivic... Re, blah, blah, if I can say this without tripping over it. Revivic... Revivic... Revivification, revivification, too many V's and F's, <laughs> revitalization, there we go. It was my way of revitalizing myself was to have that fan club, you know, these groupies who, who, who just had nothing but love and adoration for me when I came home. And I had the same for them, and it just boosted me. Well, I don't have that right now. I ha all I have is me, and that whatever technology I can come up with, that will effortlessly boost my spirits. Because I get depressed from time to time, but it doesn't last. It does not last. And it, 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 like, like a cloud, the wind comes and just blows it away. Probably because I've been doing this for the last six months. So that whatever befalls me, whatever travesty comes my way, it does not last. And that's good. I get back up off my butt and I think of something happy, something constructive to 
commit myself to, to engage myself in some activity that's productive and makes me feel good and, and pick myself up out of the rut that I thought, oh my God, this is horrible, I'm so depressed, but it doesn't last. And that's the beauty of a churning device that churns the ether, is to get rid of that bad weather that comes our way once in a while and, and just help it blow away more rapidly and not linger it for very long and make a better life for ourselves. What else can we do, you know? So attitude, help improve attitude. So this is a psychological device, but it's subliminal. Something you don't have to think about. Once you get used to it, you just turn it on and leave it on. The only thing I change is the light. I turn it on and I turn it off. But the fan I leave on all the time. I just turn the light off here so you can at least uh, see, the, see the thing. Uh, but I had to use, of course, the flash on my camera so you can see it better because I don't have a lamp nearby to uh, properly light up the ceiling so you can see it. But that's my um, gift to you, is to share with you. is to just improve yourself, your own life, and the welfare of your family. And don't worry about what goes on outside. You know, whatever happens will happen outside. Just concern yourself with what happens indoors, inside the privacy of your own living in space. And improve that and have that to fall back on, a home that you know you've improved because it feels like your home has got now set up this kind of light beacon, this lighthouse that shines whenever you leave the house. Oh yeah, you want, you want to get back to the house, but you also want to go out and do stuff. But you want to come back home because you know you're going to feel good. And you've, you've taken the responsibility of self-sufficient, self-deterministic, self-reliant responsibility to look after yourself and those whom you love who live with you to make life better for all of you. Because it all counts. It's all worthwhile. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention uh, something very important. This comes by way of Wilhelm Reich. He invented or discovered the property of orgone wrapping, the layering of alternating layers, basically a capacitor. Essentially, it's a capacitor because you have a dielectric, an insulator, in other words. In his case, he chose sheep's wool. And then you have a conducting layer. He chose steel wool. It could be anything metallic. And the dielectric, I've, ma I've made a rain-making device up there of alternating layers of mylar from Home Depot, which is a kind of aluminum film sandwiched on either side with plastic, polyethylene, I guess, and ribbed with reinforced something similar to uh, fishing line, plastic fishing line. And then the um, it already had the plastic, but it comes from petroleum plastic, so I needed something that came from plants, from the earth, and not from petroleum that does come from the earth, but is not, does not originate from plants nor from animals. So I alternated, alternated the mylar with rosin paper, which is imbued with the essence of rosin, which comes out of trees, conifers, pine rosin. But that wasn't enough. Then I shellacked it with natural shellac. And that created a very powerful orgone wrapping. Well, here, with convex mirrors, we also have an orgone wrapping. How is that? Well, a mirror is a sandwich, mostly made of glass, which is the dielectric, the insulator. And on the backing is a thin film of metal, probably aluminum, to give it that reflectivity so we can see ourselves in that mirror. Otherwise, it would just be a piece of glass. So we actually have a single layer orgone um, grouping or orgone blanket, I guess is the technical term, in the body of a mirror. And when it's convex, it has the shape, the geometry of a cone. Shallow, but it's there. A shallow, a stubby cone, you know, a stubby uh, parabolic arch, but it's there. So this is the other significant feature I forgot to mention that stems from the work of Wilhelm Reich, is that functionality to an orgone blanket. 
and he tested his orgone blanket, and, and people have tested it, and Peter Lindemann used it when he modified one of um, Trevor Constable's designs uh, called the bazooka, and the redesigned bazooka was able to be shrunk down into this tiny little tubular shape and yet be more powerful than the large bazookas that were sewage pipes that uh, Trevor Constable was using to fabricate his uh, instrument of uh, rain making. So the pea gun, you know, named in honor of Peter Lindemann, was able to be shrunk down because it was so powerful. Well, it had a mirror at one end. And I always wondered about that. Why is, does the mirror, why is it so important to have the mirror? It has the orgone wrapping, and it has a certain very finesse dimensions I won't get into, but it had the mirror. And this is so simple because when I made my little rainmaking tube, the dimensions were off, and, you know, it, it couldn't have been more imperfect yet. It had the natural shellac interspersed between the mylar layers on the rosin paper, the, the shellac rosin paper, and it had the convex mirror at the base, at one end, I mean. What w would constitute the base, because you point the uh, opposite end pointing up at the sky. Because it doesn't work any other way. I pointed it off to the horizon, that was a mistake. Pointing it straight up, the influence comes right back down, straight down where you put the thing. So you have to point it straight up. But it's the mirror that gave it the power, too. Not just the sh shellac, the natural shellac. And I didn't appreciate that. I didn't understand until I thought about it and I realized, oh, you know, it, one, you, one could argue that a mirror is an, an analog to Wilhelm Reich's orgone blanket arrangement of alternating layers of an insulator and a conductor, which basically is a capacitor not tied to anything. It's a capacitor by design, yet it's not hooked up to an electric circuit. Yet we take it and shape the dielectric, the, the insulator aspect of that orgone wrapping, into the shape of a cone and then set it spinning in motion. And now we've got something extremely powerful and potent. And that's why a convex mirror is so powerful. Why you don't need to use Trevor Constable's cones. You do need to set it in motion. And a vortex is the most powerful that I can imagine the, and the easiest because you just spin it, and, and here it is, a ceiling fan, setting it in motion. So I needed to tell you this because it's so crucial to the design elements of this apparatus in order for you to understand the background information that goes into why is this so effective. So I didn't just come up with this. I came up with the knowledge that goes with it. I just had to remember all of it because it's a lot of little details to fill you in on why it's supposed to, why it should be so significant, so efficient, so simple in design, so elegant, so inexpensive, except for the ceiling fan, of course. <laughs> well, you can get them cheap. You know, I think you can get them like under $100, like maybe $40 or $50, maybe $60. Under $100 for a good ceiling fan, a good cheap one. Um, it might last you a few years before it bums out. This is an expensive one. It'll probably last a long time. I, don't, I didn't buy it. I don't own it. It doesn't belong to me. I'm just making use of it while I rent this room. But the point is, it's so effective because it gets the job done. So this goes along the lines, if you get the Trevor Constable package at trevorconstable.com, download it, pay for it, and view the, the uh, homemade videos that Trevor made, you'll see something called the Mark II Spider and other variations, but basically the spider design. And that was when he had cones spinning. He also had cones spinning of other designs, too. So it's the basic concept, but he had the Matterhorn, and he had another one I can't remember the name of, a couple others, actually. He had various designs involving spinning cones and rotating cones. So this all comes from that aspect of his research. There are other designs that he used, such as the bazooka and later on the pea gun, but the conic shape set in motion in a vortexial pattern of spinning is, in my mind, the simplest and easiest way to set things in motion, to set the ether in motion. 
it's the, it's the most effortless. And a convex mirror is the e easiest, most effective way to get the ether's attention. I'm telling you, it, it's, it, it's, it's, it works any way you look at it, either you, by doing it or by just thinking about the logistics of why should it work at all. It has precedence behind it. And so that's why I cite Wilhelm Reich, because of that orgone blanket idea. It's so crucial to the idea of a convex mirror. Why would it work at all? But the cones don't come from, the idea of a conic shape does not come from Wilhelm Reich. It comes from Trevor Constable. He's the one who discovered that intrinsic feature of the conic geometry, that it attracts the attention of the ether. And it's setting it in motion that sets the ether in motion, setting the cone in motion. And he chose rotation because that was the easiest. But on his merchant marine vessel, when he had his bazookas stationed, they were simply going in a linear motion. The bazooka was pointed either into the path of the mer that the mer merchant marine vessel was taking or it was pointing in the opposite, towards the tail of the vessel. But it was going in parallel with the, with the, with the direction of how the bazooka was pointed. That was the way it was traveling. So it was moving into the storm front that he was trying to create, or it was moving away from the storm front that he was trying to create behind the ship, trailing behind the ship. Either way, it was pointed in a specific direction. And that's the same way they use the pea gun. They point it in, in the direction that they wish to move it in. But here, with conic shapes, you don't do that. You don't have a linear motion that you have to worry about over a, an extensive path for an extensive duration at a specific speed. You don't have to worry about that. You just set it in motion, spinning, and you use the right cone, and you add the added feature of an orgone wrapping, which Trevor did use in his earlier bazooka designs. I don't... I'm not... He might have used it on his cones. He didn't say, from what I recall. He might have. I don't know. He used specific geometries in his cones, such as the golden ratio. I haven't bothered to do that because I found this or orgon orgonic wrapping of a convex mirror to be so effective, I don't need to worry about geometry. Just the fact that it's convex is good enough. And that it's a mirror is excellent. Combination between those two factors. A convex mirror is excellent marriage of those two principles that Trevor Constable made use of when he was etherically managing and encouraging good weather. <laughs>